Hello and welcome to this video on using bounds to find further bounds. And let's just dive straight into this problem. The length of a rectangle is 11 centimetres to the nearest centimetre. So let's just draw that. So it's 11 centimetres to the nearest centimetre. And the width is 6 centimetres to the nearest centimetre. So this is 6 centimetres to the nearest centimetre. And we're told the area is A, and we want to find out the lower bound of A. And do you remember from the previous video, we said that the lower bound means the lowest possible value the area could have been. Now, to get the smallest possible area, that would be the result of using the smallest possible length times the smallest possible width. So I'm going to write area, and I'm going to just put LB there to mean the lower bound of the area. We'd use the smallest possible value of the length, i.e. the lower bound of the length. Now, if something was 11 centimetres correct to the nearest centimetre, we saw from the previous video that the smallest value it could have been was 10.5. So it's 10.5. And then we times that by the smallest the width could have been. What's the smallest it could have been? Well, if we had 5.5 centimetres, that to the nearest centimetre would be 6. But if we had 5.4, that would round to 5 centimetres, which is not 6 centimetres. So the smallest possible the width could have been is 5.5 centimetres. And then we times those together, and I need my calculator at this point, 57.75. So that's the smallest the area could have been, centimetres squared. Now for B, we now want the upper bound. What is the greatest value the area of the rectangle could have been? So this time we're doing the upper bound of the area. And to get the biggest possible area, use the biggest possible length and the biggest possible width. So the greatest the length could have been is the upper bound of this, which is 11.5. And do you remember the quick way to get the low and upper bound is you add or subtract half the accuracy. So the accuracy is to the nearest one centimetre, half the accuracy is 0 0.5, 11 minus 0 0.5 is 10.5, 11 plus 0 0.5 is 11.5. And then we times that by the greatest possible width, which is 6.5, and we do that multiplication, 74.75 centimetres squared. So can you see that with just this information here, the area of the rectangle could have varied by quite a bit. And then the last part of the question, find the error interval of A. Now, do you remember the error interval just meant the range of possible values of A? Well, we said that A could be greater or equal to any value that's above 57.75, and it's going to be less than, but not including, 74.75. And the reason it's less than that is because you can't actually have a length of 11.5. It's actually just below it, isn't it? So therefore, the area is going to be just below that value. Right, let's go on to question two. A container has 90 litres of water to the nearest 10 litres. I gradually empty it using a bucket of 6 litres to the nearest litre. What is the lower bound for the number of buckets required to empty the container? Well, let's just first see what numbers we have available. So we've got the volume of the container. So let's just use C for container. The upper bound of the container's volume. Well, if it corrects the nearest 10 litres, do you remember we add or subtract half the axis? So that's 5. So 90 plus 5 is 95. And the lower bound is going to be 90 minus 5, which is 85. Let's do the same for the bucket. So the bucket, the upper bound is... 6 plus half the axis. If it's to the nearest 1 litre, it's 6 plus 0.5, so 6.5. And the lower bound for the volume of the bucket would be 6 minus half a litre, so 6 minus 0.5 is 5.5. So we've got the up and lower bound of the volume of water in the container and the up and lower bound of the volume of water in the bucket. Now, we want to find how many buckets we need to empty this container. Now, we would do a division, wouldn't we? We can just do the volume of the container divided by the volume of the bucket, and that will tell you how many buckets you need to fill to empty the container. But we want the lower bound for the number of buckets. So the lower bound is going to be one of these values of C divided by one of these values of B. Now, if we want to get the lowest possible value possible, we would do the lowest value possible here divided by the largest possible value. If you want to get as small number as possible, you start with a low value and you divide by a big value. So that's going to be the lowest value here, 85, divided by 
the largest value here is 6.5. And when you do that on a calculator, you get 85 divided by 6.5, which is 13.1 buckets. Now we could find the upper bound for the number of buckets in the same way. So if you wanted the upper bound, you would start with the largest possible volume of the container, so the upper bound divided by the lowest possible value for the volume of the bucket. So we're going to do a big value, 95, divided by a small value, 5.5. And when we do that, that gives you 17.3 buckets to one decimal place. So that's going to be the largest possible value you can get when you do this division, and that's going to be the smallest possible value when you do this division. So that's the lower bound for the number of buckets needed, and that's the upper bound. Right, what about this third question? We've got x is 3.2 correct to one decimal place, and we've got y is 6.8 to one decimal place, and we've got z is 8 to the nearest hole. And we want to determine the low and upper bound of these various different combined quantities. So, we want the low and upper bound of x plus y. Now, to get the lower bound, if we're adding two numbers, to get the smallest possible value, well, we add the smallest two possible values. So it's going to be the lower bound of x plus the lower bound of y. And if we do that, we're going to get 3.15 plus 6.75, the lower bound of each. That's going to give us 9.9. .9. Now, the upper bound, if you're adding two numbers, you're going to want to add the greatest two possible numbers to get the greatest possible result. So we do the upper bound of x and the upper bound of y. So if we do that, the upper bound of x is 3.25 plus the upper bound of y is 6.85 and that gives us 10.1. So we could see that the sum of these two numbers could be any number between 9.9 .9 and 10.1, but excluding 10.1 itself. What about the second one? We've got y minus x this time. Now, to get the lower bound, if you're doing a subtraction and you want the smallest possible number, you would start with the smallest possible number, and then you subtract the biggest possible number. So we're going to start with the smallest possible y, so it's going to be the lower bound of y, and you subtract the biggest number, because if you subtract the biggest number possible, you're left with the smallest amount, aren't you? So it's the lower bound of x. So that's going to be lower bound of y, which is 6.75, minus the upper bound of x, which is 3.25, and that gets you 3.5. Now the upper bound is going to be very similar. You start with the greatest possible value and you subtract the smallest possible value to leave as much possible left. So the upper bound of y is 6.85 and you're minusing the smallest possible value which is 3.15 and that gives you 3.7. Now what about the last one? We're combining three quantities this time. If we want the lower bound, well with a division to get the smallest possible number, you do a small number divided by a big number, don't you? So we're going to use the smallest possible value for z, so the lower bound of z, and then we want to divide by the biggest number possible. Now, to get the biggest possible value of y minus x, we worked that in the previous part, you start with the biggest possible value, and you subtract the smallest possible value. So you have to think very carefully here. So that gives you the biggest possible value of y minus x, and that's good because you're then doing a small value divided by a big value to get the smallest possible value. So if we then do that, the lower bound of z is 7.5, and then we divide by, well, we did this earlier, it was uh, 3.7, and that gives you your result of 2.03. To three significant figures. And you can get the upper bound in, in, in a very similar way. Let's finish with one final GCC question because this one has a slightly different feel to it. We've got v is equal to the square root of a over b, and we've got a is equal to 6.43 to two decimal places, and we've got b is equal to 5.514 correct to three decimal places. By considering bounds, work out the value of v to a suitable degree of accuracy. We're going to have to see what that means. 
Well, let's just first find out what the lower bound and upper bound of V is. So the lower bound of V would be the square root of, well, to get the lowest possible value of V, we would start with the smallest possible value and divide by the biggest possible value. So we do the smallest possible value of A, the lower bound of A, and divide by the biggest possible value, so the upper bound of B. So when we do that, it's the square root of, well, the lower bound of this is 6.425. And we're dividing by the biggest possible value, V, which is 5.5145. It might be helpful to write out all these bounds first uh, before we start putting them into the calculation. And then when we do that, we get 1.07940. I'm going to put lots of decimal places this time. You'll see why in a second. And then the upper bound is we do the square root of, well, we need the biggest possible fraction this time. So we're going to do the biggest possible value of A divided by the smallest possible value of B. So when we do that, the upper bound of A is 6.435, and the smallest possible value is 5.5135. And when we do that, we get 1.08034, etc. Now, so we know that V lies somewhere between this bound and this bound. That's the error interval. But we just want to pick a single value of V, just a single one. Now, what some people think you do with this kind of question is you just use the midpoint between the two. But that's not the right thing to do. Basically, if we want a single value, we want to make sure that whatever that value is, that both of these bounds round to that particular value that we choose. Because then we know, regardless of what the value was in this interval, and we don't know where it is in this interval, we at least know that if we round it to a particular number of decimal places, it will definitely give us our value. And what you do is you basically pick the value which gives you the same value for both of these when you round it to that number of decimal places. So let's just say that we were to round both of them to one decimal place. This would be 1.1, and this one would also be 1.1. So it would give the same value. So we could quote 1.1 because we know that wherever the value is in this interval, then when we round to one decimal place, it gives us our value that we have. What about to two decimal places? Well, this gives you 1.08, whereas this one gives you also 1.08. So we could quote 1.08 as the value of V, because we know any value in this range would round to 1.08 to two decimal places. What about to three decimal places? Well, this is 1.079, whereas this is 1.080. Now, these are different, so it wouldn't be suitable to quote the value of V to three decimal places, because depending on what the actual value was of V somewhere in this interval, it could have been 1.079 or it could have been 1.080, we don't know. So we're therefore going to choose this one, because that's the greatest amount of accuracy you can quote, where both the lower and upper bound round that value. So the answer you write is... Work out the value V, so you write V is equal to 1.08 because, and this is the reason you give, both lower and upper bounds are this two, two decimal places.